everybody, it's the Chief Bonnie with Board Games, and this is a review of Austerlitz 1805. Beautiful cover, by the way, but I say that, and I say that a lot. This is a miniatures game, which uses counters, double-sided. There are no hexes on the map. There's no zones of control on the map. You will simply be able to move certain amounts of distance, like a miniatures game, based on the type of unit you have. Let's go in, we'll take a closer look. This is not going to be detail, but there'll be enough for you to understand um, how movement works, how the units look, function, um, and a very basic, not all the chrome that's attached to it, but a basic rundown of combat. And then we'll be back. All right, zoomed in on Austerlitz 1805. Beautiful box. You can see the fog. Just real simple. Understated. Love it. All right, let me uh, first pan around. I'll show you the map. I've bagged up all the bits and we'll go through just looking at the rules and the helper guides. So let's just take a trip around here. Slide down so you'll see and I'm going to see if I can zoom out a little bit. There we go. All right, so we have what looks like one long map here, but let me show you, there is a seam board, but quite big. Fits together, again, just to show you some of that detail there. You can see those are forests up ahead, and then you can see these lakes, rivers, and the name of the game, and then some of the, uh, some of the areas to track turns and whatnot. Now, I've bagged these pieces and we're going to get a little bit of glare. I'm not going to show you those right now because I'm going to get them on the board. But the big deal about the pieces, is maybe I pan too fast, is that the blocks are gone. So you don't have any stickers to worry about. So when we do get into the pieces, uh, you'll see they're, they're counters. So they're a little thinner, but boy did it save all that time going through the stickering phase. Let me pull these up so I can bring them on. Um, so the uh, rule book is glossy paper. Uh, don't worry about this, just a min misprint here that's supposed to say 1805. It just kind of slid through, but you can see the pretty art. The rule book is 28 pages with a sequence of play on the back side. Let me set these other things down so I can work with two hands. So it's a glossy paper just stapled on the end. So you can see we've got some color on the inside. I'm going to move through pretty quick. So one of the neat things about the rule book, not neat things, good things. So plenty of pictures, plenty of breakout pictures show you what's going on, but they actually have a playthrough as well. And here we go. The example game turn. Now I love this. So this will walk you through how to do simple movement and things of that nature. Now I'm going to show you that here, but I'll try to keep it really short. But again, you can see you get walked through and then you've got even some designer notes. So you're going to each side will have these fog maps. So there was fog at the beginning of the, uh, the actual conflict and it was so thick units could not see each other. That is what the fog boards will be used for. And you have to use a screen so that your opponent can't see them. So what's been created is an allied screen that has just some nice information in here. All right, you've got both English and Spanish, but it will also stand up and work as a screen for you. So that's why you have a screen. You can see the French one here as well. All right, screen. Just to show you some of the uh, counter trees. Everything's punched out. You can see how many you have and you can see the time that's been saved to you in putting stickers on these units. Um, so you've got all these that are punched. Yes, you do have a, uh, an artillery, um, big old artillery piece that uh, you'll use there and then the smaller one for canister. You've got some scenario cards. I'll just flash through scenario cards, part of the game. What the other side, Spanish, yes. All right, three scenario cards that'll come in. You've got your terrain effects table. Everything's explained. You got fog explained on here as well. And 
over here, Spanish. And we've got the combat modifiers, fire and combat table, all right, all on this blue page. And again, Spanish. So what are we looking at? Now, I may do some overlays here as well, just on the side of the screen, um, so you can kind of see some pictures from the rule book that explain the same thing. You have columns, and you will be dealing with infantry, cavalry, artillery, and HQ, or headquarters units. Now, I'll go into all these units a little bit more later, but what I've done, rather than flip them over here so it's not all fiddly, I've actually showed them in their column formation. Very easy to see because the words or the unit type are all set up in a, in a column type format, so it's easy to kind of orient, orient them. Same deal if you were to flip this counter, all right, boom, you can see you have a line formation, but I've just set a separate unit up so that you can see what the line formation looks like. Again, we have a guards or a elite infantry, both set up in column and line. And then you can see your um, leader here, Napoleon, is blank on the other side because they will be attached they will attach themselves to a unit, and we'll get into what happens when headquarters or uh, yeah, headquarters or leaders attach themselves to units. So for artillery units, they use a little bit different nomenclature. It's going to be limbered. Limbered is when they're in column formation and they're just being transported, and unlimbered is when they're in what you would think of as line formation. They've lined up their cannon in order to be effective against the enemy. You'll also see there's a white stripe going down the middle. There's one over here with the allies as well. I'll bring them over. And that is the difference between foot artillery, which is here, and horse drawn artillery, which is here. You're still dealing with limbered, it's being drawn by the horses, and unlimbered, it's been set up. Um, not to go too far, but you can even have um, artillery units step away from their guns when they're threatened, usually by um, cavalry, and they can step inside the protection of a square. And the cavalry threat leaves, boom, they can run back out and uh, address their guns again. All right, I've set up the movement markers, the or the UMs, the unit movement markers, to show how far these units, types of units can move. So first of all, if you have your units in a square, they can only move half. Half a UM has that line delineated right down the middle there. So you can just easily see if I can drop it back on and now it's all messed up. <laughs> okay, half. <laughs> Foot units can move two, and what you'll notice is, again, I've used two units here, and you can see the delineating line here. And you can always turn up to 45 degrees with your UM. They're supposed to be touching. All right, so, and then if this unit were to move, what would happen is, without me juggling it all around, you always put the center of your counter so I would do my full two UMs. You don't have to, you can do less. You can do whatever, as far as you, as long as you don't exceed the two. And you move from that spot to the next. Now I'm in column formation. So it's the exact same if this unit were in, I would have to make some room. Let me move all this over. But if we had, and let's not go into, the hill here. But if we were in, or this unit was in line formation, the UMs always line up on the center of the counter or the block. And if I were to move my full two UMs, I would simply then move it to the front. So you can see being in line formation is going to restrict you in a certain amount of your movement, about a little bit more than half because of the length of your unit uh -huh, I can't flip it. Boom. So if I were to then move again, I'm again moving from 
the center of that unit. Now you can see we have mounted, so here it is foot. Here we have mounted. Mounted units can move up to four UMs. Now they do provide these longer sticks, There's nothing on the back here, um, and each one of these is one. So you can see the delineating line is showing that that is one UM, two UMs, three, and four UMs. Again, the unit would then end its movement all the way up here. Headquarters can move up to six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So again, I've used one of the big ones. And then I have some of these littler ones in here just so I can move around. And it's as simple as that's obviously, that's probably not what I was going to want to do, but whatever. All right, so before we go into the real basics of combat and a turn, the victory conditions are all very straightforward. So first of all, you will have some scenarios where they're simply listed. So scenario three, the player who controls, oh boy, Partsenberg at the end of the last turn wins the game. And in scenario two, the player who controls Santon at the end of the last turn wins the game. But... You can also see on the board these red uh, names. These are victory locations. You can see this big boy. Ooh, I've got my light on. Whoops. Hold on. <laughs> so the, the red areas are also victory locations. And depending on which side you're playing, um, you will start with some victory locations already in control. So, of course, that begins the tug of war for key strategic locations. You also receive one victory point for every artillery and HQ unit that is eliminated. And in case of ties, the allied player wins. Now you may say, how do you control these things? Do you have to just sit on it? No, you do not. Um, the last side, whichever side, if you have a unit move through that victory location, you control it. You don't have to leave guys behind or a garrison or anything like that. It's just you've moved through it. It's yours. So there are automatic wins for both the Allies and the French as well. For the Allies, an automatic win would be if they controlled all of these key locations, these target locations, for at least two consecutive turns. Now the auto win um, condition for the French is very similar. So to control all of the target locations, for two consecutive turns, but the French also have to have eliminated at least seven allied brigades. All right, so what you can see with the strategic map is, this would be hidden by my screen. So I know which one of these units corresponds to these. So just to show you real quick, let me grab the tongs and flip these over. I think maybe I can get them. So there's a decoy, easier without the tongs. Uh, there's the 17, and here is another decoy. So my opponent would not see this. They would not know that this area down here, currently this chit is a decoy. Now, there are some other rules on what can be in those, these corresponding numbers. So in a particular box, that fits an area outlined on my strategic map board, which you can see here corresponds with here. So within this zone right here is my 17 counter, which is these troops. And I've placed it in time and space on the map, and this is these units here in the box. Now there are rules on how many units a chit and the type of units that a chit can represent. And of course, if it's a decoy chit, then there's nothing represented at all for a decoy chit. Um, it's just there so that I can do feints and movements so we can preserve this fog of war uh, that is going on. So this is a very nice system. So, all right, I'm gonna talk about the sequence of play and then I'll just show some quick combat. So each game turn represents 60 minutes of real time in the battle. All right, so the rally phase is over and I'm gonna move in and show you the rest of that 
turn or that phase will go. So the artillery unit gets to do defensive fire against this French unit, which is moving up on this other line unit, the Allied line unit, to attack. Now, a unit it fires at has to be within its line of sight, and it's got to be within range. So, you can see if they're firing cannonballs, there's quite a uh, amount of range, and you can see even the angle of attack. At the range that we are, you can see we have canister also available. So it's as if the French unit is preparing to attack. I will uh, first resolve this um, artillery unit's canister shot. We'll then re uh, finish with resolving the movement of the attacker. And then we'll go into the differences between um, musketry firing and close combat. So I've already determined that I could use canister instead of ball ammunition uh, with this artillery unit. You can see the ball ammunition reaches out much, much further, but the point of using canister is it's like a giant shotgun and it just spreads out and it'll, it'll hit anything. You don't have to do the die roll for it. If I was firing ball ammunition, all right, the shot, um, I would have to roll, and in this case, I would need a three to hit if I was firing um, ball rounds, shot. And a four would be a hit if I was firing even at longer distance. But I'm firing canister, so it's an automatic hit. I don't even need to roll for it. Now, when using the template for canister, if it touches any other unit, so if I'd even had a friendly unit, up in that area, no matter how slightly that canister shot touches it, it will do damage to all other units that it touches. Now, normal ball ammunition can be fired over friendly units, but let's get this out of here. We're using canister. All right, so we know we have a hit. So let me set this down. I know I'm probably gonna mess up the, uh, the chits underneath. Um, so we'll come in and we look at what we have going on here. So we have artillery firing at a line unit. You come across and see that there's a zero modifier to what's going to be a die roll over here in a second. However, we come down and we see that canister is a plus one. So canister is a plus one. Now I'm not going to explain everything on this chart, but we know we're coming over here and we're now going to add plus one to a 1d6 die roll. So we come in here, we roll, we got a four plus one makes it a five. Check morale is what CHM means. And in this case, you can see we would have been checking morale on a three, a four, but in this case, a five, we're gonna check morale with a minus one. And if failed, retreat with an S and an S means they're shaken. So we can see, let me get this canister out of the way. We know it took a canister shot. The morale for this unit is eight. We're going to minus one off of that. And if they can get, and so in this case, a seven or less, they will pass the morale check and they'll be unaffected. Ooh. All right, so this would have been an 11. So they didn't pass. They failed their morale check. And while the chart says shaken, the rules say stunned, but they each use the parentheses of the S, and of course the D is disorganized and the R is routed, but stunned is when a unit can only move up to half of its movement allowance, and it cannot change formation. A few record-keeping things we would do, we would show, I've moved everything here by accident, we would show that this cannon fired. We would also place a stunned marker on this unit, there's some other sub rules that will go with that, but we wouldn't get into it. And in a future rally phase, that stunned marker would come off and the unit would retreat. Now it has to retreat its full UM, which is two. Now I'm going to just display what that would be because I'm going to take this off as if it was a miss. So I can show you what a little bit more of the combat would have been if, if uh, that canister or well, the canister would have hit, but if it would have had no major effect on the unit. All right, so we've resolved the artillery fire, canister shot. We're gonna pretend as if it had no effect. The French unit declares that it's going to continue its movement within, 
with the intent uh, to go into close combat with the allied unit. It closes in adjacent, and now the allied unit will have a defensive musketry fire, which will be this little circle here, five. I will take a photo so that we can see it. You will also see that the French have a five. All right, we have a line of allied troops doing defensive musketry fire against the French. So we have an allied line firing against a French line for a plus two modifier. Now you can see um, if you're firing against someone who's in column or someone's in square, you're going to get a higher modifier. And there's some other modifiers down here as well that will often come into play. But right now, we'll just take the plus one defensive modifier. We will roll one D6. We've got a three plus one, which would turn it into a four, which would be a check morale. So again, as you know from the um, uh, fire that we had with the canister, the morale for the French unit is eight. There is no minus one to this, so they roll two die, and they have a six, and their morale, uh -huh, their morale was not broken. They will then get a fire chance. They will fire a fire chance, but they will now fire in preparation for their close combat bayonet attack. We would resolve that. So you've had the defensive musketry fire, the preparation musketry attack from the French, and now they're coming in for close combat. It's a line against a line, which gives you zero on the modifier. There are several modifiers down below that could come into play. Um, you would then, the French would roll one die and get a six, which is awesome. And there would be a morale check for the allied player minus two. They have a morale of seven. You can see they've got a five, but we did minus two, meaning it is a five, but if you're the number or below, you pass. Now again, we've seen what happened when the French unit was hit with the canister. So you can end up with all these different, uh, you can have the uh, stunned or the disorganized or the routed and all the little um, effects that that has. And this is going on generally all over the map. So I've glossed over some of the more in-depth detail here, what I wanted to do. So there is some more, there's some crunchier details in here, but I wanted to show you the general effect of how these how this play turn or how these rounds work and how basic combat works. I think you should have an idea whether or not the game is for you at this point in time. Let me pop out and give you my thoughts. All right, we're back. So right off the top, I want to say I like the fog rules here. The fog's right on the cover of the box. The strategic board that you use in conjunction with the chits out on the map is perfect. So you could have a decoy. It means nothing. Or you could have a numbered chit that corresponds to a box that has a mix of different types of units inside that box. So I know that that is my double cav cavalry unit with the horse artillery. It's going to be fast, but you don't know that. And then once we're in contact, boom, comes out. Oh, and now you know or maybe it's just a single line entry, uh, unit or a guards unit. So the fog of war literally is preserved there. Now this is a miniatures game, so I can't say it enough. If you don't like those miniatures aspects as far as measuring out your movement or um, the measuring out of when you can fire musketry, they make it pretty easy. It's a half UM. Um, if you're literally in contact with the other unit, then you're going to have a combat. You can go with the bayonet phase. So, all actually what a miniatures game is, is fairly intuitive. Uh, here you're getting to see the counters. I actually like the counters better, I think. A little more fiddly, I guess, when I'm picking them up and moving them around. You know, the blocks are chunky. You got something you can pick up. But man, having a sticker, all those blocks, I still remember having to do that with the Waterloo game. Not that it's hard. You know, I'll put on a podcast, or usually I can't watch a movie at the same time, but I'll put on a podcast and just dedicate the time to getting it done. But I'll take the counters any day of the week 
to avoid having to do that. Um, I still love how the counters or the blocks when you're in column and how, how you can just, I mean, it's so easy and intuitive. Oh, they're in column. Okay, now I'm going to move them into a line formation. Great. And again, uh, the combined arms that are able to come in with the use of your artillery, uh, both the ball that can reach out and touch and loop over top of your troops or the canister, in which case you better not have anybody in between your giant shotgun and the folks that you're shooting at. Um, but uh, the morale systems and how the you, you can really cause some discord or hate discontent. If you get a unit that's routed, that's suddenly in retreat, whew, you can see how it just unravels. Uh, not to mention how when you're able to get into a full line and really bring multiple units in together um, and, and, and use them in concert with each other. And I didn't go into the detail on this one. Um, I think I meant to, but I forgot about it, but uh, how the headquarters attaches. So I didn't explain it on there, but a, a headquarters, um, the commander just attaches to a unit and you then use its morale score because that commander could hold that unit uh, together. Um, it's, they're better, they're command and control. And it, it can reach out to one UM to other units, not their same morale, but it gives them a plus one. So headquarters, and they're so fast, you saw that, that they can zip around the board and come in and, and, and hopefully give that boost that you get from key commanders of the era. So, um, again, I can't say it enough, it's a miniatures game, and if you love miniatures, I think you'll love this. If you're not into miniatures, I like when counters are in place of the miniatures. I'm not into, this is just me, nothing against those that are into painting and building the, the, the units and all that. That's a whole hobby in and of itself. That is not for me, so I like counters. When I opened this up and saw it was counters, I was like, yes. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it, but you can go buy the upgrade and get the blocks and then the stickers come with it and you can sticker it. So those that want blocks, you can go get them. I will stick with the counters, just me. Even if I gotta use tweezers on occasion. All right, game it, you gamer gods. See ya. Chief.